Good evening, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us, especially after dinner. Um, you guys are the real troopers this evening for sticking with us um, through the seven and eight o'clock hours. My name is Angela DeRosa. I am the program manager for the Western Problem Gambling Resource Center. And it is my privilege to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Timothy Fong. Uh, Dr. Fong is a professor of psychiatry at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA. And he's a board certified uh, adult and addiction psychiatrist. He's the director of the UCLA Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship, a one-year program that provides clinical training in the management of addictive disorders. Uh, He's also is. the co-director of the UCLA Gambling Studies Program that examines the underlying causes of the clinical characteristics of gambling disorder in order to develop effective evidence-based treatment strategies. And he's also part of the steering committee of the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative, whose mission is to address the most pressing questions related to the impact of cannabis legalization through rigorous scientific study and discourse across disciplines. So we are excited to be able to share this information about um, both cannabis and problem gambling and really be able to help folks who are in the addictions fields and those of us who are experiencing situations of crossover with cannabis and problem gambling. So without further ado, Dr. Fong. Thank you, Angela. And thank you to everyone for logging in virtually. I wish I could shake everyone's hand and give everyone a big hug, but during COVID, obviously that's not appropriate. So I wanna thank uh, again, the council for inviting me out here for your second annual virtual conference. Uh, it turns out I remember fondly in 2018 coming out in person pre-pandemic to New York's um, Council on Problem Gambling Annual Conference back then, and I believe it was in Albany, and I did do a version of this talk then about marijuana and gambling, but we have a lot more information, a lot more updates in the last three years, so, so bear with me as we go through these slides. I'm logging to you in live in LA where it's 65, 70 degrees today. We had our first rainstorm a couple of days ago and everyone was freaking out. Um, I'm actually not in my offices today. I'm actually in uh, our guest house. So if the kids run in to do something, I'm not, uh, you know, please pardon the interruptions. All right. So with that, let me go through what we have here today. First of some uh, disclosures to where we do receive funding for some of the work that we do, not only in uh, gambling disorders, but also cannabis use, cannabis use disorder and other addictive disorders and things like that. Goals here today are, are clear. Number one, I wanted to highlight what do we know about that relationship between cannabis and gambling. Number two, I wanna talk about how the legalization of gambling is likely to impact not just gambling, but also gambling disorder. And lastly, I wanna give a clinical roadmap, a prevention roadmap, if you will, to really focus on best practices of what we should be doing when we're working with clients from intake, um, when the doors close or when the Zoom goes on, what should be the things that we should really be thinking about in 2021? Because there's a whole new clinical uh, tool set that we uh, actually uh, uh, have now. Dr. Fong, for some reason, uh, we're not seeing your slides. Okay. So let me just up a minute ago. Yeah. So let me go back to, let me try to do the share thing again. And also, sorry, while we have a second, Angela, this is the interpreter. Would you mind making Tiffany and or um, to Lassie, a co-host for us to spotlight ourselves. Thank you. Sure. Hold on a second. Uh, how does that look now? Is that working now? Yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. Hey, Tim, do you mind mentioning that second thing you said, the relationship, best practices, and what's in the middle? Yeah, the middle is that uh, we're going to talk about how expansion and legalization of, gam of cannabis and how that's going to impact gambling behavior as well as a gambling disorder. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're good. All right. All right, so let, let me just start off with a recent case of some of the patients that we see at UCLA and how the interplay between cannabis and gambling disorder may actually look at. And this is a, a, a man who presented for gambling disorder and depression treatment. He came to UCLA, he called me up, and he said, I need help with gambling and depression. And in a classic 
presentation for gambling disorder. Large amount of debt, a lot of stress and emotional pain from gambling, impaired ability to do his job, arguments at home, loss of social capital, not exercising, overweight, not good health care. So things that we see. His preferred form of gambling was poker, table games, online and live. Um, he used tobacco, he vapes, but no other substances were reported at intake. When we asked him, do you use any drugs? Do you use any other addictive substances? He said, no, no alcohol, no heroin, no pills. The first few sessions moved forward, cognitive behavior therapy, gambled anonymous support, medication, antidepressants for his depression. But he keeps coming back and it doesn't really seem to work. He's still gambling, he's still depressed, he's still emotionally in a lot of pain. After six sessions, he says, hey doc, you know what? I do use cannabis, quote, regularly, but I didn't think to talk to you about it because it's just weed. Now, the reason it came up is that after six sessions, I began to wonder, well, how come he's not getting better? Then I went back and said, you know, in addition to some other substances, tell me about cannabis. Is that part of your lifestyle? As it turns out, as we do a deeper dive clinically, he met criteria for cannabis use disorder. He was using two to three times per day, combination of edibles, as well as smoking a joint, and occasionally using a high concentrate cannabis called wax, where he would use two or three times a week. So piling it all together, doing a structured interview, it turned out that he was having an unhealthy relationship with cannabis. It allowed, it turned him into being a motivated, emotionally numbed. And he said, well, you know what? I actually do use cannabis before I go to the casino because I think it helps me calm down at the poker table. It allows me to tolerate the idea of losing more. So it's an issue where I wanted to bring up clinically because here's a story. Did his gambling disorder, his repeated losses, his continued engagement in gambling lead him to use more cannabis? Or was it the opposite way around where he was using cannabis and in a way that was so uh, problematic that that actually led him to gamble more? In other words, by using cannabis before he went to the poker tables, did he then end up losing more money? Did he end up staying longer? Did he become more impulsive? How do we address cannabis in the office when outside the office, everyone is calling it just weed? And how many other men and women are out there that are using cannabis with gambling disorder or gambling disorder and cannabis in a way that's really problematic? So let me first start out. The first segment of this uh, presentation, I want to just highlight some thoughts of the current cannabis landscape in America and what's happened here in California, because it's going to happen in New York, as it already is, but even more so. First off, 2021 trends. We've now reached generational acceptance of cannabis and demand from the public. It's marketed as what? Health and wellness, as medicine, as endemic to society. You know, uh, we have a 16-year-old and 11-year-old. They're growing up in a world where they don't know what it's like to not have cannabis. Uh, where I'm living right now, I was telling Angela before we started, it is about a one minute walk to the local cannabis dispensary from our home. I could also order cannabis to be delivered to our home and all that would be considered legal and above board. Number two, that also has resulted in profound perception of harm among high school seniors going way, way, way down. And so when young people don't think of harm from cannabis, what will happen? You're going to see, of course, increased use. Number three, we see the emergence of big weed as an environmental, economic, political power. Just last week at Nevada, they had a, a conference called MJ Econ, where they have well over 10,000 attendees. So cannabis as a tremendous marketing force, as a tremendous economic force is here to stay. So that's in contingent on us as clinicians and advocates and prevention to be working with, quote, big cannabis and big weed to get our messages of prevention, early intervention and treatment out there. And lastly, I would submit to you partly why we created the Cannabis Research Initiative was this. 
was could cannabis be a medication? Could cannabis medicine be an actual specialty? Could we use cannabis in a way that actually promotes health and wellness? As an example, pain, sleep, treatment of depression, even just reducing the opioid epidemic. Got muted. One of the things we're looking at right now at UCLA is that question, does cannabis reduce one's opioid need? So if you have pain, could you then use less opiates and instead and then you use cannabis? So things that we're really interested in. Okay. So here's a California cannabis story. And if you haven't been to California in a while, it's fascinating. These are photos taken from places in California, Los Angeles, where you can obtain cannabis. Here, it looks like the Apple store, right? Well, no, this is kind of a typical cannabis regulated dispensary. So again, the dispensary that is right around the corner from my house, we walk in, it looks like this. Sophisticated, clean, cash only. Now they're starting to take some credit, uh, but you can see the wide, vast array of different types of cannabis available on the shelf. A few years ago, right before the pandemic, we had a museum of weed in Los Angeles that was viewed as a tourist destination. All this goes to the acceptance and now people embracing cannabis as part of the narrative. Imagine if this were to happen in the 70s or 80s. There's no way. There's no way it would be accepted as legitimate. There would be no museum of heroin that would be allowed. Well, instead, this actually happened. This was before the pandemic a photo of a cannabis consumption cafe in Los Angeles, where you go, you buy cannabis, you could buy food, you ingest and consume your cannabis on site, just like a bar. Why do I bring this up? Because again, that's going to change the landscape over the next five or 10 years when you have cannabis consumption lounges in New York. And what if some of those lounges are of course inside casinos? Or what if those lounges have betting and gambling inside the lounges themselves. So you see how the intersection would be really, really powerful. And even more so, self-delivery kiosks. And even during the time of COVID, the idea of cannabis being more available and more uh, easily obtained without having to uh, socially distance, or you, know, you can just go to a kiosk. Imagine a kiosk inside a casino. Imagine a kiosk inside an o uh, OTB, or a kiosk you know, in, grocery store. Again, rapid expansion availability of cannabis. Here's an ad in Los Angeles. Um, well, if you're just driving around, you're gonna be like, I don't know what this is for. You think it's for like some lotion or some sort of like shoe. But if you look at it, it says ease, cannabis delivered, delivered wherever you are. This is a billboard that's about 100 feet from the UCLA campus. And look at the size and scope. Again, all highlighting the, the, the acceptance, but look at the billboard itself. You don't see any messaging on cannabis addiction prevention. You don't see a 1-800-GAMBLER. You don't see any sort of resources. Again, just fully right there in your face. So in California, what happened nearly 25 years ago, we approved cannabis for medical cannabis back in the mid nineties and that was passed. And then for nearly 20 years, it sat in this very strange space of medical marijuana where you had to get a recommendation for cannabis from a physician. You then took this recommendation letter and you got a cannabis card that you take to a dispensary and you had a special knock on the door and then you'd get the cannabis and you'd buy it. All that changed dramatically five years ago. So five years ago, in November, 2016, we're coming up on that five-year anniversary the state of California passed through a proposition that passed like 65% to 35% to allow adults to grow, hold, use, and buy cannabis for non-medical purposes. And the restrictions were pretty obvious, you know, not around schools, you can't have it in your car, you know, you can't just, you know, sell it between, but I as an adult could own it, I could possess it, and I could give it away to friends casually. So there were some clear rules here that it was not necessarily, it doesn't have to be medical, it can be adult use. So let's look at what's happened in the five years in our state. It took two years for it to actually get operational. So January 1st, 2018 is when the first recreational cannabis uh, dispensary opened. And now we're three years into it. 
And what do we know now in 2021, nearly two and a half years into regulated legal cannabis? It is a massive issue. And the number one, the statewide revenue has exploded every year. Just in second quarter of this year, so March, or sorry, April, May, June, April, May, June of 2021, total sales equaled about $1.3 billion. Times that by four, we're looking at nearly five, six billion dollars brought into cannabis dispensary. That's a tremendous amount of money and tremendous amount of tax revenue, several hundred million dollars of tax revenue that I get a tax with. So we know the market is expanding, demand is there. Number two, the unregulated to regulated market still is much more on the regulated side, where we have a lot of dispensaries that look fancy, that look like the Apple store, but it turns out they're not actually operating according to the letter of the law. They don't actually have an official license. So the idea that this shuts down the unregulated market or the illegal market is false. The unregulated market will continue to thrive because the demand is just so high. Number three, what we're seeing is a lot of social justice impacts happening. We're seeing misdemeanors for cannabis possession being expunged. We're seeing felony convictions being overturned for possession. Uh, we're seeing more underserved uh, um, um, you know, communities being able to have business opportunities to own their own dispensaries, but it's not happening as fast as we'd like. So a big majority of a lot of these dispensaries are still owned by major corporation venture capitalist dollars, which still creates a little bit in of inequity between uh, cannabis owners. Again, public perception has changed where California now has viewed cannabis as part of the lifestyle, as part of popular culture. Nevada, as an example, not just California, but Nevada has also had a massive uh, success in terms of cannabis growth. We're here, just fiscal year 2021, a billion dollars in adult sales in, Can in, in Nevada. So tremendous amount of money here. As an example, we're talking about California, how much cannabis can an adult purchase per day? Now, I didn't get a chance to do the polling here, and you can see the various options. Think in your mind, a gram, half an ounce, an ounce, a pound, unlimited. And the actual amount, and I don't know what the New York amount would be, but here in California, it's actually an ounce. So what does an ounce look like? And you can see there in the bottom, it's about 28 grams of cannabis, which could translate to anywhere between five or six joints. But one ounce of cannabis is not all created equal, of course, because concentration changes. So it could be 10% THC, it could be 20, it could be 40, but it's still one ounce. And by law, it's really just one ounce that uh, you're allowed to purchase. So I could actually purchase an ounce of very high concentrate THC and have that available. And of course, nationally, that's why we see the trends and prevalence of uh, cannabis use, you know, again, just exploding. And you see here, just in the past month here, ages 12 or older, just 10% of the population reporting using. So those are tremendous numbers that we have to take an advantage of and, and highlight inside our intake process and make sure we talk about that. Concentration matters. And again, the more and higher the concentration is, what are you going to get? More effect more side effects, more adverse problems, more addiction, more demand. Again, people want high potency experiences because again, the intoxication experience is very, very potent. And these are an example that over the last 25 years from just cannabis samples that are seized by the DEA just off the street. And you can see how they range tremendously from essentially a couple percent in the mid to late nineties up to 15% of THC in samples. Again, technology has advanced rapidly in production and distribution and things like that. One quick reminder for providers, uh, you'll hear a lot about K2 or spice. These are not produced from the cannabis plant. These are synthetic cannabinoids. These are person-made, they're synthetic because they're chemically generated by dried plant material, which tends not to be cannabis or hemp even, plus man or person-made chemicals creating this product that looks like cannabis that's oftentimes sold in head shops or sold online or available at some of these unregulated uh, cannabis dispensaries. This, why we bring it up, is much more unpredictable, much more potentially dangerous in terms of psychosis, 
intoxication and agitated behavior from spice. Not cannabis, again, synthetic. We often have to get a lot of questions about what's the difference between CBD? And you see CBD is everywhere, right? And again, just as a reminder for our providers, CBD comes from the cannabis plant. It's one of over 80 different kinds of cannabinoids, but it's the cannabin, it's called cannabidiol, which tends to be uh, thought of as having much more impact on pain, inflammation, not psychoactive. And one of the things that we have to remember, hemp, according to the United States Farm Bureau, is cannabis plant that has less than 0.1% THC. And it can have a whole wide variety of CBD concentration. And that's why it's legal. And that's why you see CBD products sold over on Groupon, in your local CVS, or even in your Bed Bath & Beyond. And that's exactly where I got this photo. This is a CBD infused cotton pillowcase that was available for purchase at Bed Bath & Beyond. And really highlighting this idea that CBD is great for all that ails you. And they particularly marketed this as allowing you to have better sleep. So it's a surge in demand for CBD. Unfortunately, the science does not back that up. Now, and for the record, I did not buy that. I looked at it, I thought, you know, I gotta buy this for research purposes, but I actually held off and did not find it. All right, so as a reminder, before we get into the cannabis and gambling side, cannabis impact on physical health. And this is things that we should be reminding ourselves, talking to our patients about. This is not, quote, just weed. This is a highly psychoactive substance. This is also a substance that has tremendous impact on our physical health. Increased heart rate, increased risk of myocardial infarction, heart attacks, vasodilation, uh, dropping your blood pressure, potentially reducing your abilities, uh, your body's ability to fight off viruses. There's this false narrative that cannabis protects you from COVID. It actually increases your risk of doing poorly if exposed to COVID because it uh, limits your uh, immune system. The cancer risk at this point still is unclear, um, but it's not been debunked. And one of the things we are seeing more and more because of the higher concentrated products are cannabinoid hyperemesis, where patients are showing up in the ER with violent vomiting and nausea. And I would imagine this could also occur whether they show up into substance use disorder treatment clinics, residential programs, you know, physically ill from just using uh, high concentrated products. When it comes to mental health, my one takeaway is this, that cannabis use in anyone who's seeking mental health treatment is more likely to be harmful than therapeutic. And I'll say that again. In other words, there is no clear scientific evidence right now to suggest that cannabis as a medicine for treatment of mental health conditions, depression, anxiety, insomnia, PTSD, substance use disorder will be affected. That doesn't mean we don't know it won't be. That doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that there might be some possibilities down the road, and particularly CBD as its own cannabinoid does have really interesting uh, therapeutic modalities for schizophrenia and substance use disorder, but we don't have the science to back us up right now. So unfortunately, our language with our clients has to be much more educational to highlight that any cannabis use right now, number one, the intoxication state can be very, very severe, very, very dangerous to the point where people oftentimes will show up in psychosis. And oftentimes people will say, you know, cannabis doesn't kill anybody. Cannabis overdose is extremely rare, true. But death while intoxicated by cannabis does happen. People get into car accidents, people uh, self-injure themselves, people fall off roofs. So these things happen whilst intoxicated. Uh, we also know now that cannabis use on, ongoing will worsen the underlying psychiatric condition, no matter what it is. Depression, PTSD, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. If you're using cannabis, the primary psych, uh, psychiatric condition will get worse. Now, oftentimes people say, well, wait a minute, what about all these stories of people who use cannabis for PTSD, PTSD and they say this is the one thing that's really healthy. Well, I think what people are getting mixed up is they're getting mixed up anecdote stories, and they're also getting mixed up when people have symptom relief, but that's not helping the condition. So although you might feel better in the instant from using, over the long course of time, your condition does not get better. And unfortunately, we do know that when folks initiate the cannabis, they can get the substance-induced issues, so mood, 
anxiety, uh, thought disorders caused by cannabis, and of course, um, cognitive impairments over cognition. Cannabis withdrawal tends to be a major thing we miss as providers. So if I said to you, and I remove the top header, a patient shows up to you in your outpatient practice or any residential program, and they have these symptoms, the first thing you think about may not be cannabis withdrawal. You may say, oh, they're resistant to care, or maybe they have the flu, or maybe they're withdrawing from alcohol, or maybe they just don't want to be here. Uh, we've seen patients be called borderline because of these symptoms. Uh, and it turns out it's just simply cannabis withdrawal. You come into the psychiatric hospital, you don't get cannabis. Two days later, they have these symptoms. And oftentimes we miss that and we mistake it for something else. And instead of giving them the proper treatment, which is rest and fluids and supportive medicines, we end up giving them injections of antipsychotics. And that's not exactly uh, what they should get. Dr. Fong, Dr. Fong, I, excuse me, related to your last slide, um, we had a question, isn't cannabis used as MAT? So is, uh, isn't cannabis used as MAT? The question being, isn't cannabis used as medication assisted treatment? And I would say answer to that right now was a firm no. It's not supported by uh, NIDA, not supported by NIAAA, not supported by any professional society that I belong to, like the American Academy of Psychiatric Association or American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry for medication-assisted treatment. There's been a lot of potential, well, can we use cannabis or in specifically CBD for treatment of opiate withdrawal or treatment of opioid use disorder? But we are nowhere near ready to describe and prescribe that or recommend that for treatment. So I'll just highlight that. Again, the addiction risk of cannabis from the very, very first time you use is about 9%. So you imagine how you show this slide to a high school senior and you say, hey, the very first time you smoke a cigarette, there's about a 32% chance you're gonna develop an addiction to that cigarette. Heroin, cocaine, alcohol, we'll call it around 15, 20%. And if you show this 9% risk, I think a lot of young people would say, oh, that's great. So you're saying to me, it's one third less addicting than tobacco. But 9% is not zero. If I put broccoli or kale salads under, what's the risk of you developing a, a, a addiction to that? It's like negative percent. So nine, people oftentimes mistake this, right? And 9% is not that big of a deal. No, that's nine out of 100 people who develop a serious substance use disorder. And I think that's something we have to look at. Okay. The good news is that there are some accepted therapeutic use for cannabinoid. Now, none of these are for substance use disorder. Again, these are all um, cannabis and cannabinoids that we use for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting or wasting syndrome related to HIV AIDS or to severe seizures. Um, there are some things that are in Europe being used for chronic pain, but not available in the United States. So this is not things that would land in the lane of any of us in substance use disorder or mental health. None of these are, are useful for those conditions at this point. And again, that's highlighted again here. And, and this is a huge area of concern for me again. And this is where a recent review says very clearly, scarce evidence to suggest that cannabinoids improve depression, anxiety, ADHD, Tourette's, PTSD, or psychosis. But how many times have we had these debates with our patients that say, hey, this cannabis is the best thing for my PTSD. This cannabis has allowed me to help me be more functional. And I think that's where instead of debating, we have to really go through systematically to find out whether that's true or not. I think oftentimes people want cannabis to be really successful, but unfortunately the data isn't there. All right, so let me shift gears to gambling and say, well, how does all this relate? So it relates very well because I'll start off number one is this is what we're looking at in 2021. If you go onto like the Google Play Store or on Facebook ads or iTunes, you start to see this blending of the two, just like there has always been blending of alcohol and gambling, sex and gambling, tobacco and gambling. So these are social casino games you can download right now. Uh, and they do that. And you see how they start to merge two cultures, the cannabis culture and the gambling culture. Dankest marijuana slots. How fast can you spin? Um, and you see people downloading these and looking at these. And so we know 
isn't it makes sense that there probably will be at some point a blending between big weed and casino to have slot machine inside casino that are cannabis themed. I'm they're not there yet, but I imagine it's just a matter of time before we see some of these slot machines inside the casinos. In Nevada, cannabis consumption lounges. There's one right now that's on a tribal um, property about, I think it's, like, it's maybe a half hour outside of uh, Las Vegas. In 2022 though, you can see here, this is a recent article talking about cannabis consumption lounges. These are places, again, you go, you buy your cannabis, you use, but there's no gambling inside them yet. I foresee, again, in the next five or 10 years, you're going to see slot machines added into these cannabis consumption lounges, or you're going to see a large casino say, we are now introducing a sophisticated cannabis consumption lounge inside the casino in and of itself. That's an example of what actually it looks like. You buy, you use, you get uh, your various products, and you spend time inside the lounge just singing, dancing, uh, and having a good old time. Allegedly, that's what they said. But from the gambling industry point of view, why this isn't yet, why they aren't all over it right now is because it's still a Schedule I um, controlled substance. There's still Controlled Substance Act from the federally prohibited. But as soon as that's decriminalized or potentially legalized or look for when the federal government removes cannabis from the Schedule I DEA license, that's then going to open up these potential opportunities. But if you're a casino owner, you're like, at this point, I, I don't want to deal with it because how do I manage cannabis intoxication? How do I manage federal laws? How do I deal with my employees who are urine? You know, it's, a whole, it's a whole lot of uh, questions. But, and even more so, the money you know, that are generated inside cannabis dispensaries many times can't be deposited into just federal banks because, again, the feds see it as illegal. So... A lot of these dispensaries in California, they literally have thousands of dollars of cash and they drive around these Brinks trucks depositing that throughout the uh, United States. So really interesting stuff. Um, okay, so we, we're gonna answer all the questions in the chat. So uh, please, uh, that's terrific. So I really think this is where we're headed. And you, you, you look at the future of gambling, of course, separately. When you merge it, it's all on the phone. When you merge, the live streaming, when you merge the video game industry, when you think about who are the digital consumers right now, the young people who are already living in this virtual world, the Twitch, the YouTube, the social media channels, how they already have cannabis popular culture consumption on Twitch and on YouTube. It's just a matter of time before they start merging off to the, the gambling. And so that's really where we think about, well, what does this mean for us? Let me back up now. So what do we know about right now? Does cannabis increase or decrease gambling behavior? So you went to a casino on a Friday night. Let's say you're not with gambling disorder and you don't have a cannabis addiction. If you use cannabis and then your friend doesn't use cannabis, will you be likely to spend more at the casino or spend less? So let's take a look at what we think we know. And much of this is purely speculative. We don't have the science to back it up. We do know that cannabis, when you use, consistently should, number one, make you more impulsive. Number two, make you take more risks, make you more likely to ingest other substances that are in front of you, tobacco, alcohol, prescription pills. We know that cannabis would change your perception of time. So when a user are intoxicated, you say how many hours have passed, they'll say a completely inaccurate number. And we know it will alter your mood state. We know it will alter and impair your decision making. So if I just said to you in front, here's a substance gamblers will ingest before they walk into a casino or before they log into a online casino. Obviously we would be massively concerned regardless of whether they have a cannabis addiction or not, that this would could clearly impact their uh, gambling behavior. Vice versa, what do we know about cannabis use again on gambling on these other domains attention impulsivity how one deals with losses of course one of the things we see with a lot of our clients that they lose and if for whatever reason the losses don't stick emotionally the next day and they go back right 
or vice versa, they lose and then the losses burn with them really hard, which then triggers more gambling. So what we don't know is what happens to cannabis and, and how does it impact that gambling experience people go through? Does it reduce urges and cravings? Does it make urges and cravings for gambling go up? You know, a lot of interesting questions. So likewise, what does gambling do to cannabis use? And most certainly, I think, if cannabis is available in a casino environment, if cannabis is easily purchased where you gamble, then most likely, again, you're going to have more cannabis use. It just makes sense. So particularly, they're marketed together. But think about, again, that a lot of our gamblers and their role models, if you get more popular culture, more professional gamblers, more YouTubers and live streamers talking about gambling and and cannabis together, I think that's going to certainly drive the gambling culture to promote and use cannabis as part of it. So some of the questions upon her, and again, we don't have the data yet. These are us to think as a field. How do we address these? How do we actually do better at mitigating the harm? The impact of gambling on the impact of cannabis on gambling disorder is essentially unknown. We do not know whether cannabis use, if you present for treatment with gambling disorder, makes gambling disorder treatment harder, more likely to relapse to gambling, whether you're more severe gambling. We don't know any of that stuff. We also don't know, could cannabis or certain cannabinoids treat gambling disorder? I had, I had one patient who insisted that his gambling recovery was going very, very well because he started using CBD products. And I said to him, if that's true, let's document it. Let's track it. Let's really be specific about what you're using and how it impacts your gambling disorder symptoms. And it came to be essentially what, what it was, was that it was a little bit more of a placebo response where he thought that by ingesting CBD that he'd be too, quote, stoned to drive and it would be unsafe for him to drive. And that's what actually kept him from going to the casino. So it really wasn't like working on his urges or his craving or anything. Yeah. It was much more on just giving him a false sense of, oh, it's unsafe for me to drive while I'm on the computer. Okay. So here's some real data from our uh, state of California. Our treatment program is called CalGets. We've been in operation for about uh, 12 years now. We see about 1,000 gamblers uh, a year. And we see about 500 men and women who are affected by someone else's gambling for a total of about 1,500 clients that come through our state system. Uh, since 2009, we've seen over 12,000 individuals uh, who received no cost treatment uh, for gambling disorder. So we're really, really proud and excited about that. Um, but to give you a sense of what uh, the trends are in our clients, according to the national surveys, about 19% of California report using cannabis within the last 12 months. That sounds really low, doesn't it? Given how much cannabis is out there in California, but that's what our national surveys are showing. Among our gamblers that come into treatment, that number is about 21%. So it's not significantly much higher, it's just a shade higher. But when you think about um, over the last few years, that number is going up. So the blue, was right when cannabis was beginning to become legalized in California, but 20%. And fast forward, it's just two years later, that number jumped up to 26%. Um, our numbers for 2018, 2019 also reflect around 26, 27%. So every year, the more mature the cannabis market becomes, the more likely gamblers come into treatment also using. And right now, they're still using higher than the state average. Here's also, again, a, a highlight of what happens with our providers when we focus on treatment in cannabis, is that their cannabis use is going down after they get treatment for gambling. It's not a huge number, 21% report using at the start, 13% report using at the end of treatment for gambling. Our goal is we have to do more to get that number much lower, because again, there's real no evidence to suggest that the cannabis is actually going to be helpful for their gambling disorder. Now, what about men and women who are affected by someone else's gambling? So these are the spouses, these are the children, uh, and it turns out the affected individual is that they are using it at about the same rate as the general population in uh, California, but that's not zero. And again, how that impacts someone, uh, I think, in, uh, who's been impacted by someone else's gambling, I think that 
is very, very important for us to look at. All right, so let me focus on the clinical relevance and why this matters and what we should be doing moving forward. Number one, the vast majority of us have not had any formal training about cannabis at all. Where it is, what kind of products are out there, signs of intoxication, signs of addiction, signs of withdrawal, and what specific treatments should be used for cannabis use disorder. So that's why we have to build up our clinical skill set in that area. I think we have to recognize uh, cannabis use as risky and harmful is not as evident as with other substances. So again, it's not as clear. So someone who shows up intoxicated or with a substance use disorder to cannabis, it's not like meth. It's not like cocaine where you can see it easily. You know, there's no doubt about it. It's a little bit more of a mushy and, and harder diagnosis, I think, clinically to make. I think one of the things I always ask patients and who are using cannabis, say, well, what reason are you using it for? Do you view your relationship with cannabis? Are you taking it as a drug as something that just kind of alter your body, brain, and mind? Are you taking it as entertainment? What are you taking it for? Or do you believe you're taking it as medication for sleep, for depression and anxiety? And that always starts that conversation uh, about you know, uh, the science and about um, you know, uh, how it works. I think though, again, for us, we have to do a very good job of tracking that relationship between gambling and cannabis. So when they come into treatment, if we know what they're doing with cannabis and then as treatment moves forward, we can really determine whether or not cannabis is improving or detracting or, or creating relapse situations uh, when it comes to gambling. So here's a roadmap that I think number one for ourselves as a provider to get better. We have to raise our knowledge about cannabis um, and its product. So that means as, as, as an example, going to a regulated dispensary and looking around and asking questions. Um, for me, I like to go to the dispensary to see what products are out there, to see what people can buy, and to ask the bud tenders who sell these products, what do you know? What training do you get? And in a lot of surveys of bud tenders, it's amazing that about 60% of them make specific recommendations on what types of cannabis to use for medical purposes. Wait a minute, that's like going to a bar and asking a bartender to say, what kind of drink should I have that'll help me sleep better tonight? And this wouldn't happen, and yet this is what's happening every day in regulated cannabis dispensaries. So I think we have to do a lot better there. Number two, for us as providers, we gotta get in the habit of asking about cannabis at intake, not just including it, do you use any other drugs? Because people oftentimes don't view cannabis as a drug. They just view it as weed. So getting better at our assessments and our screening questions. I like the question, tell me about your cannabis use in the last six months. Tell me about your relationship with cannabis. Tell me how you view cannabis in your life. Those are a lot of the openers I like to kind of get in a sense. If you're someone who's very big into um, screening tools, a cannabis use disorder identification test is available, which is a lot like what we do for alcohol. Self-score gives you kind of a cutoff point of whether or not they may have cannabis use disorder. And again, we have to constantly be asking those questions about cannabis use disorder with our clients, making those linkages. Because again, a lot of our clients with cannabis use disorder, they're kind of quasi-functional. You know, they're not breaking the law, they're not getting into accidents, but they're not advancing in life. They're kind of just stuck. Um, and they'll say, I'm really depressed or I'm really anxious. And They'll say it's because of COVID and no, it's because of the cannabis in itself making things worse. All right, so during the course of treatment for gambling disorder, I think we need to add these in. We need to document the cannabis use and we need to document its relationship and impact on gambling behavior. Does it help? Does it hurt? Does it not do anything? Then let's report those trends. Put them to uh, New York Council of Problem Gambling send them over to NCPG, send them over to us at California to get a sense of these are the things that we're seeing in the clinic about what people are doing and not doing uh, with cannabis. And I think we really have to pay very close attention to when we see partnerships. Imagine a partnership between DraftKings, FanDuel, MGM, Caesars with the largest cannabis companies. So I think it's just a matter of time. And once we see that, it may be too late for us to interject and add in really 
effective prevention messages and early intervention strategies for that partnership. I think about, again, the day that you would walk into a casino and see a bevy of, of cannabis themed slots and then a cannabis consumption lounge and then a mobile app. Imagine a mobile app, you know, and, I, and we were just talking beforehand about how uh, New York will have sports betting, right? And very soon. So if you have a mobile app for sports betting, and then that also has tie-ins with a local cannabis dispensary, the possibilities are mind blowing. You know, you know, make a bet on this, and then uh, you know, spend a hundred dollars on the uh, sports betting and get uh, a couple of free joints delivered to you. I mean, this these are all possibilities I foresee potentially could happen. So that's what we do here at UCLA. We study cannabis. Uh, we look at all things, both therapeutically as well as potentially adverse by it. We have a whole host of videos. If you want to take a look at our website, where we have a whole bunch of about talks on various aspects of cannabis, you know, cannabis for cancer, pain, addiction. Uh, we even have one on uh, uh, CBD. We have one on athletic performance. So really what I would call kind of very interesting and leading edge topics related to cannabis. Uh, we have a Twitter feed. So if you wanna follow that to get the latest uh, updates on cannabis, please do. Uh, that's our group for our cannabis. And likewise, we also have a major group for our gambling studies program. We've been uh, doing this now for 15 years. Dr. Richard Rosenthal and I have been close friends and partners from this from the very, very beginning. And for anyone who is um, finishing up their doctoral degree, we do have postdoctoral positions available to study anything related to can uh, gambling uh, available here at UCLA. So if you're, if you're interested in that, and you're starting your career off in, in gambling, uh, think about coming out to LA and spending some time uh, doing some extended research with us. That's our website where we also do have information. Uh, we don't have videos yet. We're gonna have some videos soon up on various things, but oftentimes a lot of the various uh, things that I do end up on there. For instance, uh, I wanna thank Craig Carton for uh, and Dan Trelaro for having me on their uh, podcast a few months ago. And uh, my name is Craig, so I have a whole uh, podcast episode on there on our website. That's our partnerships. And I know that you had Lynn Goodwin, so I have to put a shout out for Lynn. I know she may, may not be here, but this is the kind of stuff that Friday Night Live creates, right? These are created by young people um, doing that prevention work for gambling. And I think we have to have uh, more prevention work uh, created like that. That's our UCLA Gambling Studies program, some of the folks that there. And a picture of the last time we actually got together in person, uh, that was June. We have not seen each other since then, and we've just been managing everything remotely like everyone else. Okay, plenty of time for Q&A. Let me open up the chat and see where we're at. But uh, Angela, if you can also help me with the chat, if you wanna Absolutely. fire out those, that would be very, very helpful. One Before of that, the- My contact information, my direct office line, my email. I always love getting emails. Even if you have observations, questions, notes from the field, if you need clinical supervision on a case, you can email me. I'm happy to coordinate and, and provide some other stuff. Uh, of course, these slides are there. And I have my own Twitter handle, but I don't have 10 million followers yet, maybe like a couple hundred, so whatever. All right, so let's turn it over to the Q&A portion. So Angela, why don't you just fire off the ones that you want answered. And yeah, we'll one of the earlier questions, um, one of your slides mentioned K2, and there was someone on here working in a prison setting and wanted to know if there is any um, research being done specifically among the prison population of those using K2 as well as having a gambling problem. I doubt it. I mean, I, I, I don't want to say no, but that's a very narrow and specific topic. And I, I, my guess would be no. In fact, when you just look at NIH funding for gambling, we all know it's, it's, it's tiny and it's barely anything. And oftentimes they're related to like, like gambling as decision making, not gambling disorders, we think about it. So definitely an area that we know. We know, of course, that a gambling continues to be a very, very uh, frequent activity in, in all jails and prisons and, and, and probably escalated during the pandemic. Great. Um, so we also have someone who's been working um, with a client who has not been able to stop using cannabis and has a problem with scratch offs. Do you have any quick and dirty treatment recommendations for working with both of these issues? Well, you know, this is where we go back to our principles of addiction treatment. 
I firmly believe in treating all the addictive disorders simultaneously at the same time. So that's why all these principles work, you know, uh, about really highlighting there is an unhealthy uh, activity that focuses on scratchers and cannabis. We need to work on both at the same time. And I, ironically, people will say, well, how do you do that? And oftentimes, if you were to sit with me for a half hour or 45 minutes, you'd be like, well, why is it a big chunk of my time is focusing on, on doing the things that we know are way healthier, not trying to stop the things that they have not been able to stop. So focusing on sleep hygiene, physical activity, stress management, healthy nutrition, just doing those four things alone takes up so much time. But when people can do those things, that's when all the other addictions start to fall simultaneously down the road. I think what's unique there is seeing if there's a link between the cannabis and the scratchers or the scratchers and the cannabis. In other words, like if they say, well, I only end up buying the scratchers after I've used cannabis, then you know our first task is going to be to breaking that link to say, well, in order for us to break that link, we have to stop both. And the way we do that is by stopping both simultaneously. Great. Is there a test available yet to measure cannabis intoxication? Is it related to driving while intoxicated? You know, that's a great question. The answer to that is no. And again, people have tried for the last 15 years to say, what is the blood level of cannabis that's unsafe? Now, alcohol, of course, is 0.08. But that's not true for cannabis at all. Some people have said it should be 50 nanograms per milliliter or 100. But it doesn't work that way. If I'm a consistent user of cannabis, I may live every single day in my life at like 100 or 200 uh, level. That's, and I'm not intoxicated per se. Or I could be a very naive user for cannabis and just take a couple puffs and be floridly intoxicated because of the concentration from just one or two. Or in cases with edible, I might take one or two edibles and a few hours later be floridly intoxicated, you know, and have a blood level that's very, very small. So now what a lot of um, you know, um, agencies are doing are roadside field sobriety tests that aren't just, you know, the walking and things like that, but actually are a computer-based, app-based tests that are specific to cannabis. We don't know. I think that's just something that we have to follow more closely. But it's surprising that, you know, people think, oh, I can't get arrested for a DUI for cannabis. Can I? No, you can. And I've had a number of cases where people got arrested because they had cannabis in an open container and in the front seat. So that's a violation of state law. And then they failed a field sobriety. And none of it had anything to do with their actual blood level. It was it was clearly they were not able to uh, operate heavy machinery safely. Do you have any recommendations on what an awareness or educational message should look like between a gaming operator and cannabis partnership? Wow, you know, not off the top of my head. I think it goes back to um, what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, again, right now, no gaming operator is going to touch cannabis right now because it's federally illegal. But that's where we talking to a, a gaming operator that would be very curious to see what they would want. If they view cannabis as a way of getting new customers or engaging, you know, clients for longer or getting customers to gamble more, that's problematic. I think if they say, no, 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 this is a way of enhancing entertainment experience, you know, like the $2 buffets or the, the shows, you know, with great talent, that's a different kind of story. So I think that's why it gets really complicated. Because again, for us as providers, anytime industries do things that look predatory or look deliberately to get people to spend more money, that's a concern. But if it's to get people to have healthier recreation, that's a according to the letter of the law, that's also a different message. So uh, I would say that would have to be why we have to talk to these operators now, get to know them now, because they're already thinking about it and they're already planning for when the federal shield drops, what they're gonna do. And they're certainly not gonna tell us until later. I think that's why it's important to have those conversations now. Uh, one question is, what is the success rate of your facility? So is it, you know, that's a whole thing in and of itself. So when we say success rate, 
it goes back to me that I'm hearing a uh, treatment outcome that has benefit, uh, benefits in, uh, in recovery. So again, in California, we have residential treatment at Beth Shuva. Uh, we have intensive outpatient. We have uh, 180 providers in our outpatient network that provide uh, treatment. If you look at our website, we have a lot of outcome stuff out there. It's a story is, as you would expect, the more sessions people have, the better they do across the board for gambling, mental health, and substance use disorder. The principles are amazing. Is they're always the same. The more treatment people get, the better they do. Um, and I think that's really where it's, it's important. One of the things that we're starting to look at is that for our gamblers with cannabis uh, problems, do they drop out of treatment sooner? Do they have more severe gambling problems? And right now we're not finding that relationship, but I think you know those treatment outcomes are, are gonna be this, uh, similar um, to other uh, disorders of addiction. And how long is your residential treatment program? So I encourage everyone to take a look at Bet Shuva, B-E-I-T, T apostrophe S H U V A H Bet Shuva. Uh, they call it the Right Action Program. Uh, it's run by Yael Landa, L A N D A. She's from New York, uh, as well as Brad Ruderman, R U D E R M A N. Uh, if you just put that into the Google, uh, you'll find it. They uh, we fund from the state perspective, uh, right off the bat, no questions asked, thirty days, and oftentimes the state, upon reflection and clinical review we will fund month two and month three. So there's a possibility that many men and women with gambling disorders can stay and receive residential treatment for 90 days at no cost. That's tremendous. We feel very fortunate for that. But Shuva will take anyone from anywhere in America. And uh, their cost uh, out of pocket is like between six, thank you, Rich, for putting that in, six to $10,000 per month. Um, and what we found is that in residential settings, for those who are clinically appropriate to be in residential, they need to be in there at least 60 to 90 days. Uh, and I think that's, 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 that's the nature of, of this condition. Great, so folks, we are out of time. There were a couple of um, non-gambling related cannabis questions. So I would encourage you to reach out to Dr. Fong via his contact information that's on the screen right now. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Fong, for joining us and sharing your expertise. This was a great presentation. And certainly thank you, all of you who joined us at this hour of the evening.